Good evening. My name is Chris Dorman, co-host of the So What podcast, and it's my great privilege to speak to you this evening on what is Easter Sunday. Um, for those of you who aren't watching it live, that's when this is uh, uh, being posted. Um, today, billions of Christians all over the world are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The resurrection of Jesus from the grave is of paramount importance to the Christian faith. In fact, without the resurrection, there is no Christian faith, right? What would we worship? Who would we worship? Why would we worship a dead Savior? Before I was a Christian, like a lot of people, I had questions, many, many questions, doubts, things about Christianity which didn't make sense to me, and one of them was the resurrection. And my friend Adam, who led me to Christ... We talked about it, and I remember one point, we went through the various theories about the body being stolen and this and that, and, and he said, look, he said, Chris, look, if you show me the bones of Jesus of Nazareth, he says, I'm done. I'll walk away from the faith immediately, because if Jesus is dead, then I'm living a lie. I'm believing a lie. I'm worshiping a lie. My life is a lie. Jesus spoke a lot about his resurrection. It was a, a big part of his teaching ministry. Uh, in Matthew chapter 12, verses 39 through 40, and chapter 16, 21. In the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. Chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, for example. In fact, Jesus spoke about his resurrection with such frequency that even his enemies, even his enemies were aware of this teaching. In Matthew chapter 27, starting at verse 62, the scriptures tell us this. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that, that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. That's right. That's why there was a, a guard posted at the tomb, because the Pharisees were, were so aware of what our Lord had said about it. They wanted to make sure that his disciples, his zealous disciples, didn't just steal the body. Just say, see, see, he was telling the truth. What is Jesus talking about with his disciples immediately after his resurrection? When he meets with them, Luke tells us in his gospel, in chapter 24, verses 45 to 47, Then he, Jesus, opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sin will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And Peter, in obedience to his Lord, in his first recorded sermon in the book of Acts, what is he talking about? In Acts chapter 2, what is Peter talking about? What is he preaching about? The resurrected Christ. The resurrected Christ. Men of Israel, he said, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. In other words, you were witnesses. You saw what he did. I'm not telling you something you don't know, that you didn't see with your own eyes. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One, Jesus, see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently, Peter said, that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. 
But he was a prophet and knew God that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Right? Remember? David was promised that one of his descendants would sit on his throne forever. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of this fact. And he goes on and on. What happens? 3,000 people come to faith, primarily on this testimony of the miracle of the resurrection. And what does the Apostle Paul tell us is of primary importance, of utmost importance, of chief importance. If, if you forget everything else, remember this. What does Paul say that is? In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Now, what is this gospel? For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Paul goes on to say in that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, that if Christ has not been raised, what? Paul says that his preaching is futile. It's a waste of time. He says that it's useless, and he says to the church in Corinth, so is your faith. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 14 and 19. James Montgomery Boyce said this about the resurrection. He said, the resurrection is the historical base upon which all other Christian doctrines are built and before which all honest doubt must falter. The resurrection is the historical base upon which all other Christian doctrines are built and before which all honest doubt must falter. So if the resurrection is so important, and beloved, I trust that you'll agree with me, the resurrection is just that important then why didn't Mark in his gospel write about it? Huh? What, what are you saying? Last week I started talking about the sovereignty of God, and I had every intention of talking about the sovereignty of God again tonight. On Friday I spoke with Don, and he said, You know, Chris, I really think that instead of doing a So What podcast on Saturday, that we should both just meditate on the resurrection, we should meditate on the Word and pray, and really seek Him for what we should speak about on Sunday. I said, okay, but I knew pretty much what I was going to do. I was going to talk about the sovereignty of God. Then I talked to my wife and told her what my plan was to talk about the sovereignty of God. And she said, you're not going to talk about Easter? And, uh, of course, she was a little flummoxed with me, which is nothing new. <laughs> and she said, essentially, because it was Easter, I had to talk about the resurrection. So when I went to bed Friday evening, I had a lot of things going through my head. One being my concern about switching gears, because um, I'm kind of a, a methodical person, and when I get something in my head, I want to see it through. And I started talking about the sovereignty of God, so I thought that should continue. But I have, I've got to listen to the counsel of my wife and Dawn, and, and Lord, what do you want me to do? Well, as I was lying in bed, praying and contemplating what I should do, of all things, <laughs> a movie scene came into my head. A movie scene, a scene from the movie Ocean's Eleven. Now, I don't know if you know that movie or not. How many, how many of you are familiar with that movie? For those who have never seen it, it's a, a couple of guys uh, decide that they want to rob three different Las Vegas casinos. And they gather a, a group of thieves together to pull off this big heist. It's a big deal. It's really dangerous. There's a lot going on, a lot of complexity, a lot of things go wrong. Brad Pitt was one of the ringleaders. And his character's name is Rusty. He's talking to one of the other characters who's played by Matt Damon. His, name, his character's name is Linus in this. And he's really young, and he's really inexperienced, and he's really nervous, and he's got this really important part to play in this scam. And so 
Brad Pitt's character is talking to him about what he has to do to pull this off. Let me just play this for you. Let me see if this, let me see if this will play. Come on. Whatever you do, don't under any circumstance. Russ. Yeah. Can you take a look at this? Sure. So I'm going to post that to the So What Facebook page, the entire clip, so you can see it. So he goes on and on for, for several seconds telling him, don't do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. And then at the penultimate moment, he says, now, no matter what, no matter what you do, be careful, don't ever do, and then he's interrupted. And he never gets back to it. And so Matt Damon is just sitting there going, oh my gosh, what is it? What is this thing that I can't do? What does this have to do with Easter? As I contemplated the meaning of that movie scene, one Bible verse came to mind. One. Mark 16, verse 8. And it is this verse that I want to talk to you about tonight. What is Mark 16, 8? Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Mark 16, verse 8. No resurrection. An empty tomb, yes, but... They didn't know what it meant. The women didn't know what it meant. There was, at this point, no miracle. Just an empty tomb and some confused, frightened women who had no idea why the tomb was empty. Now, how many of you have that verse underlined in your Bible? <laughs> Mark 16, verse 8. Probably not very many. I know I do not. As far as I know, all modern translations have this kind of language in them. I'm just going to show you my Bible. Right here. I don't know if you can see that. Right there. This is Mark 16, verses 9 through 20. This little statement prefaces those verses. Okay? And it says this. You need the glasses for this. The most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses... Do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. In other words, the last verse in Mark's gospel is trembling and bewildered. The women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, you know in your Bible you probably have those verses, 16, 9 through 20. And as I said, most modern translations have them marked off in some way. The reason is simple. Because in the earliest and the most historically reliable manuscripts we have, those verses are not there. That's right. They're not there. Those verses were not part of Mark's gospel. Mark did not write them. They were a later edition. There's no reference to those verses until in the mid-6th century, and Irenaeus talks about them. Did you know that not only is there no mention of those verses, verses 9 through 20, did you know that there are two other alternate versions of Mark's gospel? Yes, there's one that's shorter, and there's one that's longer, that we have manuscript evidence for, but they're later manuscripts, and it's clear, it's absolutely clear that these are additions, that these were not original to the text. So in other words, there are three different endings to Mark's gospel after verse 8. So what does this all mean? Well, without going into the reasons for it, without going into the reasons why people thought at a very early stage something was missing from Mark's gospel, it means this, that Mark's gospel, as far as we know, there could have been a page that was lost or something like that, absolutely true. But what, what we can say with certainty is that Mark's gospel ends at Mark 16, verse 8, and verses 9 through 20 do not belong in the Word. They're not authoritative. They are not the Word of God. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. That's how Mark's gospel ends. Kind of like that scene from the movie, right? Something of critical importance is missing. John MacArthur says this, about verses 9 through 20 of chapter 16 of Mark's Gospel. The earliest and most important New Testament manuscripts do not contain this section. Evidence from the Church Fathers also weighs against the authenticity of the longer ending. 
the church historian Eusebius of Caesarea, along with the Bible translator Jerome, both explain, and um, Eusebius lived from 263 to 339, uh, Jerome from 347 to 420, okay, so a long time ago. They both said in their writings that almost all of the Greek manuscripts available to them in their day did not have those verses. Though there were some church fathers who show a familiarity, who, who make some reference to those passages, including Irenaeus that I mentioned earlier. There are others, such as Clement of Alexandria and Origen and Cyprian, They're, they seem unaware of the existence of those verses. In other words, the version of Mark's Gospel that they had didn't include those verses. The evidence, both external and internal, conclusively demonstrates that verses 9 through 20 were not originally part of Mark's inspired record. That's from Dr. John MacArthur. Uh, Donald Guthrie arguably has written the most definitive uh, New Testament introduction. Okay, And if you don't have this book, it's a good addition to have in your library. Uh, and, and the introduction is just, all of this is just historical data about each book of the Bible. It's not a commentary on each book of the Bible, just the author, date, purpose, audience, controversies, that kind of stuff. A lot of material, okay? This is what he, he said, very succinctly. He said, the most satisfactory explanation of all the textual evidence is that the original ended at 16.8, and that the three endings were different editorial attempts to deal with verse 8. Because verse 8, it sort of leaves you hanging, doesn't it? Okay, so what? So what? Okay, big deal. Thanks for the history lesson. I want you to, for a moment, to put yourself in the disciples' shoes, if you will. Think about them on Friday as Jesus is arrested, tried, murdered, tortured and murdered. Think about them on Saturday, confused, scared. They could be next, right? They, they don't know. Doubting everything that they've committed their lives to for the last three years. At the, end of Mark's, at, Mark, at the end of Mark's gospel, chapter 16, verse 8, we're in the disciples' shoes. We have no idea what's there. We don't know what's going on. We're just confused. We're scared. Think of all that they had given up. Remember, at one point, Peter says, Lord, what will there be for us? We have left everything to follow you. And for those who saw Don and, and my series on the church, you understand what Paul would what, what, Peter, what Peter was saying. To become a disciple of Christ was to turn your back on your family, was to turn your back on the social safety net of the day, which turn your back on your vocation, turn your back on the synagogue, to become a rebel, to become an outcast, to be completely vulnerable, to have no safety net whatsoever. Peter is saying, look, we're exposed. There's nothing we haven't given for you. What will come of us? They gave up everything. Think of how, must, how frightened they must be. Hopeless. Questioning God. Questioning themselves. Were we wrong about Jesus? Was he the liar the Pharisees and Sadducees said he was? That's where we are at Mark chapter 16 verse 8. That's where we are. Where are you today? Where are you right now? How has your life changed over the last month? Maybe the last several months? How do you see your life changing as this COVID-19 thing wears on? Are the changes so big? Are the obstacles so monstrous? That you're wondering how you'll go on. Are you worried about what's going to happen when all of this is behind us? Will it be, will it be too late? Has something so life-altering happened to you that you have no idea how you'll go on? If so, then you have a little tiny glimpse of what those men and women were thinking. Mark chapter 16, verse 8. 
How many of you had a dream that you held dear that's been crushed? And you've cried out in angst and confusion, God, why? What is going on? What are you doing, Lord? All I was trying to do was be faithful to the vision and the call that you have put on my life. Why? What is going on? Have you ever experienced that? Are you experiencing that now? Or are you fearful that within a short period of time if things don't change, you soon will be? When I met Pastor Bob, I was a young man. I was 23 years old, I think. 23 or 24, okay? I'm 55 now. I'm going to be 56 in July. I've known Pastor Bob a long time. And at that time, I was uh, getting ready to enroll in law school. I was going to become a lawyer. And that, was, that wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do, but I thought that's what God wanted me to do. I worked in a law office. I, was, I had the aptitude for it. I understood it. I had all the things in place. I'd taken the LSAT. I got the score I needed. I was all ready for admission. And then I started hanging out with Pastor Bob, and I started studying the Word of God more. And a spark, and then a flame was kindled in my heart and in my spirit. And I realized all I wanted to do was to teach and preach the Word of God. And I went to Pastor Bob, and I said, Bob, what, am I, what should I do? And he says, preach the Word of God, Chris. I said, yeah, but there's, <laughs> I said, there's, no, there's no money in that. I'll be broke the rest of my life. What am I supposed to do? I, I mean, look, and pa Pastor Bob was... Single guy, working 20 hours a day, okay? There was never enough money for anything. And I was like, how am I supposed to put food on the table? Bob, unlike you, I am not called to celibacy. I'm, I, I'm, I feel pretty strongly I'm to be married and have a family. As a lawyer, I can provide for them. He said, he said God's going to guide you. He'll take care of you, Chris. He'll take care of you. And he asked me, what do you really want to do? I said, does that matter? He said, well, of course it does. Of course it matters, Chris. I said, well, Bob, Pastor Bob, I, I don't want to be a lawyer. I want to I wanna teach the Word of God. He said, Chris, then that's what you should do. I went home from that meeting, and I had all kinds of bar preparation materials, the, the bar exam, you know, the, from friends of mine who'd gone to law school. I had their materials, thousands of dollars worth of materials. I took it all, and I threw it in the garbage. I threw it in the garbage. In time, I got married. In time, Pastor Bob ordained me and sent me and several others, Don Wade and his wife, Mary Lou, Janine Mills, who I see is watching, greeting sister, Greg Duran, Rick and Rose Jones. Um, am I forgetting anybody, friends? If I am, I apologize. And in 1992, we moved to Denver, Colorado to start Sanctuary Denver. My dream. From that, the moment I had that conversation with Bob, my dream was very simple. I wanted a happy family and a pastor, a little church. That's all I wanted. I didn't want fame. I didn't want riches. I didn't want, I didn't want anything but that. Now that seemed like, those seemed like modest goals to me. They didn't seem extravagant. They didn't seem carnal. They didn't seem worldly or fleshly. But my story, you know, but, but that's not what happened. That is not what happened to me. A couple of years after getting here, I got divorced. The church rallied around me, but I rejected them and I pushed them away. In my pain, I, I, remember, I remember feeling like, you know those cartoons where you're spiraling and you're falling down, you spiral, spiral. That's what it felt like, and it felt like it was never going to end. There was a despair in me, an emptiness in me, a, an agony, really, that just ate at me like cancer. My dream died. My hope died. My confidence and the certainty of the call of God on my life went away. The passion went away. And I was convinced for a very long time that all hope was lost. That there was nothing for me but despair. Nothing. 
that there was no hope for me, that I had my shot and somehow I missed it. And all I could do was be mad and question God. But you know what? Just like Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 8, my story didn't end there. Just like our Savior's doesn't end at chapter 16, verse 8 of Mark's Gospel. Amen? Think of Abraham's story. Think of a Abram, right? Abram. He's an old man. He's 75 years old. God calls him into a covenant relationship with himself and says, look at the stars. Look up. Count the stars if you can. You will have children like that. A seed will come from you. Nations will be built from you. All nations on the earth will be blessed through you. He's 75 years old. It's like, okay. And he believed God. Genesis chapter 12. In, in Genesis 15, God comes to him again and says the same thing. And, and, and Abram is older and he believes him. And he believes him. In Genesis 16, it's 10 years later, he's 85 years old and he still doesn't have any kids. He still doesn't have any kids and his wife's getting impatient. Are you sure God's really going to come through? And you know what happens next, right? Right? Sarai gives, right? And he has a child, but it's not the promised child. And then God comes to him again and says, I am going to give you a son. He goes, well, just can't it be Ishmael? No. No, he waits till Abram is a hundred years old before he gives him that promised son. But can you imagine? Can you imagine if Genesis ended at verse of Genesis 16.1? Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. What would happen if the story ended there? Or what about that dreamer, Joseph? You know him, right? A remarkable story of the providence of God, the sovereignty of God, taking care of this man through all of his circumstances until he is exactly the man in the right place at the right time to save God's people. But imagine, what if Genesis ended in chapter 37, verse 28? So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. What if his story ended there? Or, or, or what if, what if his story ended at Genesis chapter 40, verse 23? The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Do you remember that part of the story? Joseph is in prison. He's in charge of the prison, isn't he? But he's in prison, right? Because Potiphar's wife accuses him of trying to uh, assault her sexually. So he's wrongfully imprisoned. And the servants of the king are in jail. And he, they have dreams, and he correctly interprets their dreams. And he says, just please remember me when you get out. And the cupbearer does not. And Joseph spent two more years in jail. Two more years. Now remember, he had this vision. He had these dreams, right, that made his brother so angry at him. Had he been misled? Did he misunderstand God's call? Did he miss the mark? And the disciples. Let's go back to Mark 16, verse 8. Go back. Go back to the end of Mark's gospel. The real end to Mark's gospel. The women, trembling and afraid, who don't tell anybody the tomb is empty. They don't understand what's going on. And the disciples, at this point, they don't even know the tomb is empty. As far as they know, Jesus is dead. And they have no idea what to expect. Jesus, Jesus did not remain in the grave. His death, his death and burial is not the end of his story. Amen? Even if the Gospel of Mark ends at verse 8, even so, we know that there is more to the story, don't we? 
And as hard as it may seem to believe, as, as difficult a time as you might be having right now, I want you to know that COVID-19 does not have to be the end of your story. Whatever your circumstances may now be as a result of what is happening right now, this does not have to be the end of your story. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? In my time of crisis, I faltered. I doubted. When, when my dreams died, when hope and what I could see was gone. I really, for all practical purposes, gave up. I gave up. And so I set myself on a path of despair. Of such needless suffering. Because in that moment of crisis, in that crucible, I said, God, I will not trust you now. Beloved, do not follow in my footsteps. Hold on to him now. Trust him now. Now above all times. Now above all seasons. No matter what your eyes may tell you. What does the word of God tell you about the character of your God? And his commitment to you, his children. What does the resurrection tell us? That Jesus is Lord. That his word can be trusted. That is our promise. That is our hope. That is our assurance. We know. We do because our Jesus lives. He lives. Whew, I'm sweating like a farm animal in here. Oh my gosh. This is just the best news, isn't it? I mean, it really is. But, but if you're in the midst of it right now, these could just be empty words. This could be stuff yeah, I've heard before. I've heard it all before. I want you to know. I, I haven't walked in your shoes, so I can't say I know how you feel. But I know what it feels like to think you're on the right course and have the rug pulled out from underneath you. I know what it feels like when all hope is lost. I know what it's like to wonder where the next meal is going to come from. I know what it's like to wonder, oh my gosh, how am I going to pay rent? I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to wonder if God has forsaken you. I do. I know what that feels like. I do. <sighs> this does not have to be the end of your story. It wasn't the end of mine. It was a glorious beginning. I couldn't see it at the time. I didn't know. I didn't have any idea. All I could see was what was in front of me. And what was in front of me was death, was destruction, was despair, was loneliness. It was not the end of my story, and this does not have to be the end of yours. Do you believe that? The God who made you, who called you out of your captivity in sin, who sent his son to die a criminal's death for your sin, who was raised to life for your justification, Paul tells us in Romans. And he brought you into a saving relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. He has committed to you that everything, absolutely everything, for your good. Do you believe that? I didn't. I didn't for a long time. I really didn't. I came across this. One of my favorite authors, A.W. Pink. It's a little booklet, little tiny thing called Comfort for Christians. I'm going to read you an excerpt from this book. He's talking about Romans chapter 8. You know the verse. All things work together. They not only operate, 
they cooperate. They all act in perfect concert, though none but the anointed ear can catch the strains of their harmony. All things work together, not singly, but conjointly, as attending causes and mutual helps. That is why afflictions seldom come one at a time. Listen to this, my friends. This is why afflictions seldom come one at a time. Cloud rises on cloud, storm on storm. As with Job, one messenger of woe is quickly succeeded by another, burdened with tidings of yet heavier sorrow. Nevertheless, even here faith may trace both the wisdom and love of God. It is the compounding of the ingredients in the recipe that constitutes its beneficent value. So with God, his dispensations not only work, but they work together. So recognize the sweet singer Israel. He drew me out of many waters, Psalm 18, verse 16. All things work together for good. These words teach believers that no matter what the number, nor how overwhelming the character of adverse circumstances, they are all helping to lead them into the possession of their inheritance in heaven. How wonderful the providence of God is in overruling the most disorderly things and in turning to our good things that in themselves are most pernicious, like this virus. We marvel at his mighty power that holds the heavenly bodies in their orbits and at the continually recurring seasons and the renewal of the earth. But this is not nearly so marvelous as his bringing good out of evil in all the complicated occurrences of human life and making even the power and malice of Satan's destructive works to minister good for his children. All things work together for good. This must be so for three reasons. First, because all things are under the absolute control of the governor of the universe. That's what we started talking about last week. The sovereignty of God. First, because all things are under the absolute control of the governor of the universe. Second, because God desire, desires our good and nothing but our good. Let me tell you that again. Because God desires our good and only our good. That's what his word says. I didn't believe it when I needed to most. What about you? What about you right now? Do you believe that? If you're wondering, can God do this? Yes. How do we know? The resurrected Christ. The resurrected, the resurrected Christ. All God's promises are amen in Jesus. Third. Because even Satan himself cannot touch a hair of our heads without God's permission. We saw that in Job. And then only for our further good. Not all things are good in themselves or in their tendencies. But God makes all things work for our good. Nothing enters our life by blind chance. Nor are there any accidents. Everything is being moved by God with his end in view. Our good. difficult as it may be, even this right now. The subservience of everything to God's eternal purpose works blessing to those marked out for conformity to the image of the firstborn. Who is that? Christians marked out for conformity to the firstborn. Jesus. That's you. That's me. If you are in Christ. All suffering Sorrow and loss are used by our Father to minister to the benefit of His children. That's what the Word of God tells us. And that's, beloved, something we must hold on to at all times, especially now. Right now, if you are experiencing trials that you have never known before, or maybe you've been stuck for a really, really long time, and you're wondering, how can I trust this God how can I believe in this God? 
because our Lord Jesus lives. Because our Lord Jesus lives. When Peter rebuked Jesus for telling the disciples he was going to die, do you remember that? Peter rebuked Jesus. Remember, he says, get thee behind me, Satan. Because Peter couldn't see anything but Jesus' death as the worst possible outcome in the world. This man who he'd committed everything to, Lord, we've left everything for you. This man who he committed his entire life to, sacrifice everything to. Of course he can't die. Of course he can't go away. Then what will I do? Who will I be? Remember what Jesus said about his death, the disciples? In John chapter what, 16, verse 7. Jesus said, It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Was Peter right or was Jesus right? Jesus said, it's to your good I go away. Sorry about that. I kicked my camera. Sorry about that, everybody. Jesus is saying, it's for your good that I go away. But Peter can't see that. The disciples can't see that. Mark 16, 8, they're, they're confused. They're scared. They're frightened, questioning everything about themselves. The women, sure, they've seen the empty tomb, but they don't know what it means. They're frightened. They're, they don't know what it means. And they go off and they don't say anything to anybody. That's how Mark ends his gospel. Many of you are thinking, that's where your story is going to end too. But we know there's more. We know there is more. Who are you going to listen to now about your circumstances? Are you going to listen to your flesh? Are you going to listen to the enemy? Or are you going to listen to the word of God? Are you going to listen to your fear? Are you going to listen to your anxiety? Are you going to listen to your pain as I did? Or are you going to listen to God and his word? Jesus is risen. Hope from hopelessness. Life from death. Our Lord didn't stay in the grave. His death was not the end, but a beginning. And beloved, as difficult as your circumstances may be, hear me. Hear me. This could be your beginning. The beginning of the rest of your life in Christ. This could be it right now. Don't be like me. Don't doubt. Don't falter now. Believe Him. Trust him now. And you, you can have a resurrection experience as I did when he finally brought me back to himself and brought me to my knees in forgiveness and with a heart of gratitude. Wouldn't it be an amazing testimony that if this crisis became a beginning for you and not an end, a testimony to your relationship with the risen Christ and his power to heal, to comfort, to guide, to preserve and persevere. A God worth trusting with absolutely everything when everything tells you not to. What happened to me so many years ago persuaded me that at that time that my life was over and that nothing but despair was in my future and that I would never know love, joy, hope again. That I would never have an opportunity to do what I love most, which is what I'm doing right now. Yeah. This is what I love. This is what I, I get so much joy and satisfaction from talking to you about the Word of God. I thought I would never get to do that again. I guess I was wrong, wasn't I? Why had I given up hope? 
because I put my heart and my mind on my circumstances, and not the God who was sovereign in and over and through all my circumstances and yours too, beloved. The choice really is yours. It really truly is. Will you walk by faith or by sight? This is what we talked about last week, isn't it? There are moments in our lives that we can look back on and we can see that was an important moment. And by God's grace, I got it right or I didn't. I can look back on those moments. I'm 55 years old. I, as you get older and you have more life behind you than in front of you, because you've lived longer, you've made a lot more mistakes. And so hopefully you've learned from those mistakes. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. Thank you, Chris. I was wrong. I was wrong. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. I was wrong. I was wrong. But where did I go wrong? By doubting God's word. I was at Mark 16, 8, and as if Matthew and Luke's gospel and John's gospel and the rest of the New Testament in the last 2,000 years didn't happen, didn't exist, I was stuck because that was only what I could see. Again, the choice is really yours. Will you walk by faith or walk by sight? For, this is out of 2 Corinthians, starting at chapter 3, and I'll be going into chapter 4 until I'm going to be skipping around. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness, with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. How are you being transformed, beloved? through your circumstances, through the good things and the not-so-good things, the difficult things, the painful things, the joyous things. That's how you're being transformed. Will you abide in Christ when everything tells you not to? But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Amen, everybody? We are hard-pressed on every side. Are you, are you, are you feeling that pressure right now? Economic, economic pressures, relational pressures, spiritual pressures. Are you feeling those right now? Paul says we are hard-pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. We're perplexed, we're confused, we wonder what is going on, but we don't despair because we know the God who's behind everything. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. Your God is with you. Your Savior lives. We are struck down, but not destroyed. This could be a time when you're going to get knocked down. Maybe it's already happened. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? One of the worst drugs is self-pity. And I say that from someone who, who drank it in, who just lived on it. Oh, you don't know what my dreams were. You don't know what God did to me. You don't know the things that I felt. You don't know the despair that I've experienced. You don't know the hopelessness that I feel. You don't know the things that I have lost. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus, for rescuing me from myself. <sighs> we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body for we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body is your flesh 
being killed right now? Is your pride being killed right now? Therefore, we do not lose heart, like I did. Though outwardly, we are wasting away. What, what do people see, you Christian? You're struggling just like we are. You've lost people to this illness like everybody else has. You've lost your job. My gosh, what's going on with you? Though outwardly, what people see, we're wasting away. But inwardly, what's happening? What's Paul say? We are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles. Don used this verse in his discussion today. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. What you see is temporary. Don't let it get your heart and mind off the eternal. Don't let it dissuade you from believing your God and his word and his promises to you, which he sealed with his blood and proved to all of humanity through the resurrection. And Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. That's right. That's right. Can we exalt Christ in our death? We can by trusting and worshiping that God. That God who has been so good to us. That God that has saved us and promised us eternal life and proven it and give us evidence of it by raising Jesus from the dead. We don't serve a dead Messiah, do we? No, not at all. Not at all. Mark 16, verse 8. While that was the end of Mark's gospel, we know that that is not the end of Jesus' story. This virus, or whatever else, seems to cloud your current circumstances, does not have to be the end of yours either. Listen, it does not have to be. Whether in life, or with as much compassion as I can say, whether in death. Happy Easter to all God's people everywhere. He is risen. Thank you for spending part of your Easter with me. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. This, you're watching a man live out his dream. You are. A man who didn't believe that was possible. A man who had lost all hope. Abraham waited 25 years. Joseph in prison two additional years. Friends, your God loves you. He sent his son to die for you. Trust him now as we remember our risen Messiah. And all God's people said, a hearty amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter, friends. God bless you.